Father, we do, um, well, thank you for this time in your word. And we do pray that whatever the distractions might be for us in the weeks that we've had, we pray that we would uh, fix our eyes on you now and see the glory um, of you and your cross. And so help us, we pray. Amen. Brill. Brill, um, I wonder what uh, people in the streets of Stockport would say if you asked them of what they think when they see this. Maybe they would say it kind of looks like a T, but not quite. Um, or maybe they would say you know, it's kind of a cross shape. You know, lots of people have it as a necklace or on a bit of jewellery, something like that. Um, now, some of them would say, which I imagine lots of people in this room would say, things like uh, the heart of the Christian faith, uh, the cross of Jesus, um, or a sign of God's love. Uh, but back in Jesus' day, the cross uh, was not the sign of anything remarkable at all. Uh, not special. Um, and of love, you must be joking. Uh, the cross was a form of execution, only saved for the worst of criminals. Um, I know we no longer have the death penalty uh, in this country, but if we did, it would be like w walking around with an electric chair as a necklace. It'd be so strange, right? Really weird. But 2,000 years ago, that sign of the cross changed dramatically as the world was changed dramatically when Jesus died on a Roman cross for sinners. Now, some of those uh, believers in the early church, the, the Christian Hebrews that we've seen in the last few weeks, believed in the cross for their salvation. But over time, they were starting to lose heart. They were starting to lose confidence in Jesus, his new covenant, and his cross. Uh, their temptation, like I said, as we've been going through in the last few weeks, um, was to go back to the old sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Um, if you like, the symbol of the cross was changing its meaning for them. From the means of their salvation to just a symbol of maybe love or a nice shape to put on your necklace. Um, it's sometimes hard for us to imagine um, that the old uh, sacrificial system was their comfort blanket. It was as easy as it, was, as it is for us, sorry, to switch on Netflix at any spare moment we get. That's how much of a comfort blanket it was to them. They were used to seeing it and touching everything and, and that gave them their assurance that they were right with God. That's what they thought would give them assurance. If you like, their excitement of the cross and everything it brought, well, over time, it just kind of faded. Can I really have assurance with Jesus, with the cross? And maybe those kind of questions resonate with you. Uh, we live in a world, um, don't we, that's all about what we can see and touch and, and do right in front of us. And so when it comes to our faith, where our salvation lies, we can so easily slip into the comfort of approaching it in the same way. Whether it's serving church, you know, how, you know however friendly we are to people, how much we go to growth teams, which are all great things to do, by the way. But the danger is we start to lean on these things for our salvation rather than the cross. We slip into funny, easier to think of those tangible things we can do as what makes us a Christian rather than relying on what Jesus has already done. Um, you know that feeling of, OK, I, I know about the cross. I know what it's done for me. But actually, that deep conviction and assurance and love for the cross, well, over time, it's faded a bit. 
And actually, although I would say in theory, yes, the cross is all I need for my salvation, I know that's the right answer. My instant reaction when I think about my life as a Christian is going, I think more about the tangible things than Jesus and my relationship with him. And so as we look at this passage together this morning, my hope is that as we go through these verses, we will know that the cross of Jesus is all we need for our salvation and has totally secured our eternal inheritance. And therefore that we can have total assurance because we know that Jesus has completely dealt with mine and your sin. But before we dive in, it's it's probably just worth mentioning uh, that this section in Hebrews is all part of what this big chunk, um, um, big section. Um, Starting from chapter 8, which we started looking at with John last week, and ending at 10 verse 18, our passage today. And it's all about the old covenant and the role of the blood. And that is really emphasised as its top and tails with this quote from Jeremiah 31. And this quote from Jeremiah 31 talks of the promise of the new covenant and that the Lord God is going to be the one who brings it about. I think that's important to mention as we go into um, our section today. So with that in mind, we see that the cross really does deal with, with sin and brings us to the promise of Jeremiah in the new covenant. And it's because of three things in chapter 9 that it shows us. So the cross of Jesus really does deal with sin because of his blood. Because of his blood. Um, Last week we saw, didn't we, um, that the blood symbolised brokenness and that actually only bloodshed, um, death, could deal with sin. As John helpfully pointed us to Romans 6 verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death. So the penalty, the cost for our sin is death. And so the only way to deal with our sin is death, the shedding of blood. And verse 22 in chapter 9 makes that really clear for us. Do do look down with me. Um, It says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Pretty clear. Blood is required. Blood is needed. So blood is the only way for our sins to be forgiven. But the question is, how can we be totally sure that the blood of Jesus was enough to achieve that for us? How do we know? Well, from verse 11, which is just a bit before the section that we have started reading today, from there onwards, it shows us that the blood of Jesus is absolutely enough. So again, even before our section, verse 12, we see that because of his blood, we get redemption. That we are ransomed, released from captivity, at the price of his blood. And then verse 14, because of his blood on the cross, we read that our conscience is cleared. Sin's gone, forgotten about. You know, that weight of sin that gets you and me down, gone when we look at the cross. Jesus has taken it away so that we can serve the living God. We can live for God as the Lord of our life. And then as we come to our section, the whole argument in verses 15 to 22 show us that the new covenant is sealed, is brought about because of the blood of Jesus. In fact, let me read verse 15 for us. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised inheritance. 
since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed in the first covenant. So because of Jesus' death and therefore his blood, because he's the great high priest, he is the mediator, he is the go-between between between God and the people in this new covenant. The blood seals the new covenant. Now, if you're confused at this point, that's okay, because the author wonderfully gives us verses 16 to 22 to help explain that in a bit more detail. So the author in verses 16 and 17 tells us that a will is, that is a promised inheritance only comes into being once a death occurs, just like a will today. You know, someone has a will, they pass away, someone receives the inheritance. But then 18 to 21 shows us that this was true of the will or the covenant. Those words are kind of interchangeably used, will and covenant. Um, Of the Old Testament, as this was brought about with the blood of animal sacrifices. So the animal sacrifice, the blood of those sacrifices, sealed the old covenant, brought it into being. And so when we come back to verse 15, we see that it's Christ's death, his blood, that seals the new covenant. And that means we receive the promised inheritance of of salvation forever. I hope that makes sense. But what we see is that Jesus' blood seals the new covenant for his people. He is the perfect mediator. His sinless, perfect blood secures the new covenant. If you like, the blood has sealed the deal. And that gives us great assurance, doesn't it? That inheritance is ours. Salvation forever is ours. All because of his blood. Yes, it's not tangible. You can't see the cross happen once a year for the forgiveness of sins like you could with the old covenant. Even though you can't see it today, the blood of Jesus really works. It's totally sufficient. That is what gives us eternal inheritance, which eternal inheritance in the book of Hebrews means salvation forever. We get salvation forever because of Jesus' blood. So the blood of Jesus takes away our sin, which gives us redemption, a clear conscience to live for him, true forgiveness and salvation forever, all because of his blood. Amazing. Amazing stuff. So Jesus' cross really does deal with sin because of his blood, but also Jesus' cross really does deal with sin because of where he is now. And we see that in verse 24. Do you look down with me. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So in the old covenant, the priests in the Old Testament would go on behalf of the people into the holy place, inside the temple that was made by human hands to be in the presence of God. But Jesus, he stands on behalf of the people, not in something made out of human hands, the tent or the temple, but he is doing it in heaven itself. That is not the copy of the true thing, but it is the true thing itself. Heaven, where God dwells. And what is Jesus doing there? Well, it tells us in that verse, he is there in the presence of God on our behalf. He's on our behalf. And this, I think, is an an amazing, an astonishing thought. If you are a Christian, at this very moment, Jesus stands on your behalf to the Father in heaven. 
He goes, I've got you. You sort it. Oh, don't worry, they're with me. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Um, at schools, um, they might um, occasionally have a head boy or a head girl. I don't know if you had that um, at your school. At my school, we didn't have that, um, but we did have something called a school parliament. I know, it sounds really exciting. Um, and basically, a guy and a girl from each year um, would kind of get selected to kind of represent the year group um, at the school parliament. And, you know, they chatted about school issues. And they were kind of like the mediator, if you like between the students and uh, the teachers. But whoever those two people were in the year, it surprisingly really mattered to people. You know, why is that person on it? They're hopeless. Or, oh no, they're super boring and serious. They're just going to introduce really boring stuff and so on. And I myself was cool enough to be on the school parliament. um, And so I dread to think, what people would have said about me. Um, But uh, people really cared about it. Um, And and we do really care generally about those who represent us. That was recently exposed by who the next England men's football manager was going to be. Should they be English? Should they not be English? All that kind of debate. Um, Also, we care about who represents our country. Um, You know, and obviously we recently voted in a Labour government. Um, We care about who our leaders are, and we care about who represents us. But who is standing on our behalf before God in heaven should matter to us the most? And thank goodness it is not ourselves. Thank goodness it's not a priest. And I think they'll be okay with me saying this. Thank goodness it's not Matt or John. Although Matt and John are great pastors to us. And I thank goodness it is Jesus, the one who is already in heaven and grants us access there one day in heaven itself. He is the one speaking on our behalf. How much assurance and confidence should that give us? Well, it should be lots. It should be lots. Hebrew Christian, I know that you could see the priest standing on your behalf and you could see him go into the the holy place. But actually, this thing that is currently invisible to us is true and so much better. Because Jesus is the best person we could have on our behalf. He really, really is. It is good news that Jesus died and rose and is now in heaven standing on your behalf. That is good news, really good news. So Jesus, Jesus' cross really does deal with sin because of his blood, because of where he is now, and also because of how often he makes a sacrifice. Uh, do look down with me at verse uh, 25 of chapter 9. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So unlike the priests who would every year sacrifice for the sins of the people, um, but also for the sins um, of themselves. Jesus did it once for all to deal with sin. Once is all it took. That is how powerful and sufficient the sacrifice of Jesus really is. Once is all that was needed. Finished. Done. Christian Hebrews, yes, you might have been able to see the priest take the sacrifice and go and see it regularly. But can't you see that can never really take away sin? You need a sufficient sacrifice and Jesus is it. That is the one sacrifice that we need. 
Now, this is um, a bit of a, a side note, um, but you might have even been noticing, even as I've gone through this sermon, you might be thinking, um, oh, Tom, you're, you're knocking kind of the tangibleness of religion a bit. And, and in fact, Matt even said a few weeks ago that there is a place for it. So, so, so what am I to do with that? I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that because I think it's important to address. Um, I do want to say clearly that there is a place for tangibleness, if you like, um, in our faith. I'm not sure it's even a word, tangibleness. Um, and certainly um, as we experience uh, the goodness of the cross. Um, for one, we have the spirit-filled scriptures right in front of us that we can see, touch, read every day, which helps us to know and love the Lord, to live out his holy gospel as we have the Holy Spirit within us that Jeremiah talks about in the New Covenant. And we do also have the sacraments, baptism, marriage, and the Lord's Supper. All of these we can see and experience the glory of the cross to the community of God's people. And in fact, one of those we are taking this morning. No, no one's getting married. Uh, We are taking uh, the Lord's Supper, where we will see, touch, eat, drink, when we share communion later. We can enjoy that incredible blessing from the Lord of being united with him and his people and strengthened as we rejoice at what his body and blood did for us at the cross. So although there are wonderful, helpful, tangible things that we have in the Christian faith, the key thing is we must not seek that for our salvation. That is what the Christian uh, Hebrews were tempted to do. But our salvation is always to be in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. But back to um, our original point, side point done, back to the back to main point. Um, that Jesus' perfect sacrifice was sufficient. And in fact, uh, do look down with me um, at verse 27 to to see how this is pointed out. Um, Just as people are destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. If we are calling Jesus our Lord and Saviour this morning, you can have confidence in the cross of Jesus that when King Jesus does return, he does come back again, we won't be thinking, oh no, did he forget to take away that sin or, or all my sins? No, when he comes back, we can be totally sure that the cross has done it all. That when he comes back, he's coming back to bring the salvation that was promised by that same king, that eternal inheritance that this, that same king has given us by his work on the cross. Um, it's theologian um, Alistair Begg said um, in a sermon, he said, if you were to die tonight and you were getting entry into heaven, what would you say? And he goes on to say, if you and I answer that question in the first person, then we've got it wrong. You know, because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this or I did that. You know, the only answer we can give is in the third person. Because he. Because he. And in fact, when we think about the thief on the cross on the day that Jesus died and died next to Jesus, as far as we're aware, he never went to a Bible study. He never met with other Christians. He never served on rotors. He never did, if you like, those Christian things. And in fact, he was a criminal. He was despised by people. But Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. How is that possible? Because he knew that Jesus, Jesus' blood, his death, totally dealt with sin. And only Jesus could give him the eternal 
inheritance. He's right, isn't he? Because that king promised it, he did it all, and so only he can give it. That one sacrifice, his work on the cross, means we have to start that answer with he, not I. So the cross of Jesus really does deal with sin because of his blood, because of where he is now, and how often he makes the sacrifice. The cross of Jesus, where his blood was sacrificed once and for all to seal the covenant. And so as we come to chapter 10, we're going through it very briefly, um, but you you might have noticed actually uh, when it was read out that it is filled, jam-packed with all these themes that we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, for example, verses 1 to 4 talk about the animal sacrifices and how they weren't sufficient for the forgiveness of our sin. Verse 11 to 14 talk about how Christ's single sacrifice was enough for the forgiveness of sins. And 15 to 17 talks of the new covenant that Jeremiah quotes and of that new covenant that Jesus brings. And so the question is, why has the author included that? Why has he included the first half of chapter 10, if a lot of it is just him repeating himself? And in the second half of chapter 10, he goes on to basically apply what we've seen in chapters 8 and 9. So again, why does he include this first half? Well, I think it's because... He's saying to the Christian Hebrews and to us today, don't go back. Don't go back. Cling to the cross of Jesus. Don't let anything else take its place. Yes, I've just explained to you how Christ's cross and therefore his sacrifice is enough. But please don't miss this. This is too important to miss. Christ's cross is enough. In fact, look down with me at verse 12 of chapter 10. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Christ's work on the cross is sufficient for all time. And it is shown by the fact that he is sat down. And that picture of Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father, one shows his power and authority. But I think primarily here in Hebrews, it's talking about how salvation, the forgiveness of sins, is totally dealt with. It's done. Just like after a long day at work, you sit down on the sofa. Done. Just like after you've put the kids to bed, after a really difficult day, of behavioural challenges, sat down, done. While Jesus, after his work on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, sat down not on the sofa, but at the right hand of the Father, his work for the forgiveness of sins, done. And to Christ Church Stop, if you are a Christian this morning, Know the relief of the cross. Know the sufficiency of the cross. And have confidence in the cross. And therefore see the glory of the cross. And after seeing the cross, as we look at ourselves and we think of the ways and that we try and you know, make things right with God, there's often big, tangible things like our good deeds or having that particular religious experience. Of course they won't work for salvation. Because if our salvation, for example, is dependent on how much I go to growth team, then the week I can't make it, my assurance is is feeling pretty rocky. If I'm not loving people as as I should at the moment, then my, my assurance is feeling rocky. But when we have our assurance in the cross, well, that is unchanging and sufficient. And so gives us great assurance. Um, We started um, looking at this photo and thinking about what our reaction to it is. 
what our reaction is to the cross. And perhaps this morning, if you're already in a place of knowing that the cross has totally done everything for you, and you know the joy and the sense of relief that comes with that, then I hope this has been a wonderful reminder of what the cross has done for you. And if you're someone at the start who, who knows this in theory, you know what the cross has done for you, but recently you've struggled to feel the joy of the cross. And if anything, actually, you've kind of been subtly or, or majorly been looking to other things for your salvation. Well, I hope that you've seen the joy of sin forgiven, eternal hope secured, and the assurance that that brings. And if uh, you're someone in the room who's actually fairly new to Christian things, well, I wonder what your view of the cross is after this, this sermon. Maybe you've at least seen in part of why the cross of Jesus is such good news. And actually, um, I hope that, you know, you've got lots of questions about the, more questions about the cross, more questions about the Christian faith. And we'd really encourage you to keep coming back um, each week, each Sunday. Um, and we love running courses, so things like the 3 to one course or Christianity Explored, which are great at just looking to see what the Christian faith is all about and about the joy that Jesus brings. And so Christchurch Stockport, the, the cross of Jesus really does take away mine and your sin. So don't go back. Uh, let us pray uh, together. Why well, you spend uh, a minute reflecting on the cross, whether that's Praising God for the cross, um, thanking God for the cross, or perhaps even repenting for those things that we replace uh, the cross with. And then our leaders in a prayer together. Father God, we praise you so much for the cross, for the glory of the cross, and we thank you so much for the assurance that brings us uh, today. We're sorry for those times where we neglect it, where we look for more tangible, easy things to, to put our hope and salvation in. But Lord, we pray for us as a church that we would cling to that cross and know that it is only the blood of Jesus that can make us right with you and that we have the wonderful eternal inheritance where we enjoy salvation forever with you, our God. And so we pray all these things in your precious name. Amen.